This is Art Talk with April, Season 5. This season, we're talking with some return artists from previous seasons and some new artists, some people that are just starting out, and some gallery professionals. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art Talk with April. Today, I have Elizabeth Reich with Elizabeth Creative. Elizabeth is an amazing watercolor artist, and she's doing art and design now. Elizabeth, how did you get started with art? Like, have you been doing this all your life? I've been creative since I was a child. Been around a lot of creative women. There's been, you know, the crocheting and the needlework and sewing and cake decorating. A lot of different domestic kind of arts, as they used to call it. And I didn't make the cut in high school for an art spot, so I focused in on creative writing in with the administrative sciences to be a secretary. Wow, Um, okay. And after my children were born and when they were in first grade, I went back to school and eventually started with an art history degree, which got me back into the studio classes for a little bit. And... Then that lapsed for nine years. And about 10 years ago, I was just like, okay, it's my turn to do something for Mm -hmm. myself. What do I want that to be? And as I've mentioned in in my about page, there was like this introspective moment where I asked myself, well, what would your eight-year-old self want to do? And the answer was watercolor. So I just dove right into the first watercolor class I could find here in Huntsville, which is at the art museum. And it was all about floral watercolor painting. So that's how it all started. Wow, my gosh, that's so cool. I would have, you know, and that's such a great question, I think, to ask yourself and kind of maybe do a reset on, you know, what do I really want deep down inside to do and to create? and Children are so amazing at just kind of knowing that and they don't yes. have that like all those, you know inhibitions. Yeah, yeah. They nothing they aren't seems to get in their way, they just do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that is such an awesome, awesome story. I love that. So you do a lot of florals, mainly florals, right? That is has been my couple? focus for a long time. And I'm just starting to probably four years ago, I had a chance to study under an abstract landscape painter who yeah. almost did no florals. And I was I wasn't ready for landscape at that time. Mm-hmm. I was interested in it, but it just I wasn't connecting with it. Sure. And I was like, OK, I'll just go back to what I'm connecting with and, and stay with that. And recently I connected with a different artist, and she considers herself, she's used the term figurativism, where Mm. it's an art movement that has nothing to do with the human figure, but more to do with the object that's your focal point. You can recognize it, but everything else around it is abstracted in some way. Oh, okay. It kind of has a push-pull play, and I'm trying to learn her style of abstracted landscape paintings wow what a cool way of i'm gonna have to look that up so i I had to look it up too even with my art history i i had never heard of that particular movement it was just kind of there's just so many isms that (laughs) you get a bachelor's degree in art history you're you're still going to miss an ism yeah really i mean there's so many and and i think you know too i mean they I mean, is that something that's been around for a while that people have done? It has been. I think when I read about it, I want to say it it was coming out at about the same time abstract art was. So that was the 1950s and 60s. Yeah. A very little tiny ism that hardly anybody grabbed on to. Yeah, you just blew me away. That's like (laughs) amazing. I love that. And when I think about it, I think I've seen art that's like that. And there is like kind of a group of people who kind of make that sort of art that makes sense. And I'm not even sure if they call it that because I hear a lot of people talking about loose and painterly Mm -hmm. and 
you know, abstracted realism. And yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, we're, we're missing a term. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I think everybody kind of, you know, sticks to those ones they know and they kind of like try yeah. to adjust it to what they're doing and figure out what they're they're trying to say. But what a cool, I think that's a great path for you. That's really exciting because one thing that I noticed on your website that I wasn't aware of is that you were doing more sort of like design elements or like surface surface pattern design yes. is that there is surface pattern design in there as well i i had an interest in patterns when mm-hmm. i was a kid i just never knew what it was even when i came back to art 10 years ago i didn't connect or recognize that the patterns i saw around me in a store were artists that were licensed yeah. by those stores yeah um, and that there was a whole world called surface pattern design and and that came I don't even really remember how I tripped across it um but that was probably five or six years ago when I I finally connected the dots and I'm like well why did that take so long well I mean it and you know you're you're right about that like there's so many things that I guess we as human beings we're just going about our lives shopping in the store and we might think something is really amazing, but we don't really think about how it was made or who might have put who thought into involved. it. Yeah. Yes. That is so amazing. I love that. And I think that your work, too, it really lends itself to that. And I think it's a beautiful way to kind of, you know, I don't know, material. Want- I'm not sure what word I'm wanting to say, but like materialize it or make it into a like an object or, you know, like home decor, maybe? Yeah, bringing it. I I feel like it's uh, another opportunity to to bring art into life inside someone's home. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And so are you, you know, licensing your your designs or anything like that? Not at this time. I just started learning surface pattern design in Photoshop in 2021 and it's Mm. not something i'm practicing on a regular basis so it's it's very rough and very slow going Mm. for me when i do go back to photoshop and say okay i'm going to put a pattern together today no it doesn't happen today it happens (laughs) you know (laughs) months down the road when i finally (laughs) managed to get it to work which isn't how the licensing world works at all you know once you get some licenses they kind of like to see you constantly bringing something new out for the next seasons oh so yeah i, I want to be practiced before i really think about yeah. reaching out to larger companies yeah i got you that makes sense and it's like so are you doing like a print on demand kind of thing i am my yeah. Website right now is through Fine Art America's, I'll call it a sister company. It's one of their branches called Pixels. Oh, And I'm using their website that I can add a few tweaks of my own, not too many. But I found their websites to be, you know, clean and well suited to what I was looking for. Sure. And then I also have Society6 and I've been dabbling in Redbubble as well. Okay, that's really cool. Try to practice with the the pattern designs and different products. Yeah. So if we're if if anyone is interested in taking a look at your art and you're like maybe ordering a pillow or something like that, you have that kind of thing on your website. Uh, My website is a good starting point, which is Elizabeth Creative, and that has limited products, but. In a little slideshow up top, it'll get them to Society6. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I have to figure out how I can link out to Redbubble. I'm limited to how many slides I can have up top. Oh, yeah, and yeah. the links don't always work in the About section. That's some gotcha. tweaking I need to figure out. Yeah. Well, that's right. I think on Redbubble, can people just find you, like put in your Elizabeth Creative? If and they it would put my Elizabeth Creative in, they should be able yeah. to find me. And if they visit my website, they'll be familiar enough with my work that they'll know 
Yeah, that, the, the that is me. Yours. Yeah. Wow. So I think, you know, what what you're doing is really lovely. I love the way that yeah. you always painted your flowers and everything. And you were saying that you you did a series of birth flowers, right? Correct. Birthday month monthly flowers. Birth month flowers. Huh. Each month of the year has its own birth month flower. So oh, yeah, my yeah. Mm-hmm. birth month is November and my flower is chrysanthemum. Okay. I got you. And so you did a series of those. And when you did that, that kind of steered you into a new direction, you were saying? Uh, I think the usually the way I worked was I, I painted when I can. And I didn't give myself deadlines. I didn't push hard. But Mm. when 22 approached and I had been working on these birth month flowers on and off for almost six years. Wow. I finally said, okay, you just need to finish this series. You need need to put it together as a series and get it done. And I challenged myself to finish one painting for this series every month, no no matter what went sideways, it was going to get done that month. Yeah, And that was probably as challenging as trying to paint, you know, something every day. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it was like, I am going to have the, you know, the perfect piece that I'm proud of to put up in my shop by the end of the month. And, you know, here you are, you're studying the flower, you're trying to get the shape right with the drawing and the colors matched. And, you know, what's the flower story going to be? And it was just, like every month at the end, I was like, I got to do this again. Oh. <laughs> I got to do the next one. <laughs> so I, I think doing that challenge just said to me, okay, I need something different. You know, mm-hmm. I still enjoy painting flowers, but I also started looking at and recognizing how much landscape and flowers are tied together. Yeah. And that I think was kind of the push towards studying landscaping a little bit more and yeah. understanding how to paint a landscape so that maybe I could bring some flowers into the forefront of a an abstracted landscape. That's the the goal at this point, is learning how to do that. Oh, that's such a and that makes sense. That really does. I think, you know, there there are different types of art in that like the the way that you were doing your flowers, it was as if like the flower was the central subject mm-hmm. and it would typically be, you know, like the main part of the painting and it wouldn't have anything in the background necessarily. Right. And then to add landscaping in there, that's really going to like open up a lot of, you know, I think opportunities to explore like the rest of the the rest of your page I guess to say or your the rest of your canvas in a way that you're and you're thinking about it in this figurative is a way in which you're going to like sort of abstract from there yeah right? trying to that- keep the flowers realistic while abstracting the landscape but not to the degree in which it's not recognizable. You know, I still want to be able to have depth of field, which is quite a trick in in landscaping. I'm realizing that my mistakes in landscape painting, or maybe confusion, is the warm and cool colors and how they push and pull Mm. and and trying to learn how to balance a landscape with the right combination of warm and cool colors, which... I'm still trying to figure out. I was going to say that. I think that's like, I haven't really done a lot of landscape painting myself. And I kind of feel like that's one of those things that's really complicated to understand. You know, it's almost like the, I guess what I'm, I'm thinking about is like how mountains are kind of blue in the background. Like if they're far away and then. Except for the ones that are around. My area of Huntsville, I live on the side of one of the foothills. So oh, okay. It's, like, it's right there on top of me all the time, which really throws my perspective off as, you know, how do I <laughs> paint something I'm living on top of? Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and occasionally when I look, because the foothills are so close to me, 
they still have the greens and the browns going. They're not yeah. receding in the background like all the landscape painters talk about. And I'm struggling with that because it's like, but but this is what I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How am I supposed to paint that right? It's like, wait a minute now, guys. I know you got I know that you guys are, you know, like you you've been doing landscape painting for a long time, but I don't know. That's not what I'm seeing with my eyes. <laughs> yeah. It's like how do I change what I'm seeing? Wow. Or maybe how do I paint what I'm seeing? Yeah. And you know what I just thought of is that your path kind of reminds me of Georgia O'Keeffe. Do you know? I've I, like, I heard that from some people. Yeah. That they, they see that. Yeah. I mean, like, not necessarily the style exactly, but like right. she was doing flowers and then and she did have a little abstraction in her, mm-hmm. you know, in her time or whatever, but then she moved on to landscapes. And I think about how, like she had all of these like mountain landscapes and hers weren't really like that either though. They didn't have that depth of field necessarily that I think about when I think about like landscapes from really long time ago, you know, like um, right. I'm trying to think of like one of the lands- landscape, uh, like some of the ones that did like, you know, like the first American landscape. Yeah. Paintings and I'm thinking Turner because somebody said yeah. something to me the other day about my clouds looking like Turner's. Yeah, which, which was high compliment. That, yeah, that was, yeah, that I was love a high Turner. compliment. But, but yeah, I, I have a few popping through my head, and I'm trying to think of names. I got you know pictures, but, like, but no names popping. Yeah. Even even Georgia Keith's paintings were very beautiful in her landscapes and everything, but they weren't necessarily like hyper realistic. You know, right? So, um, yeah, and hyper realism. I think Hopper. I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Well, that's really cool. I'm excited to see what you do with it and what you and what you have coming up with that and and the things that you create. So, how have you been doing with you? You do have like a booth area at is it Huntsville Picker? Pickers? University Pickers in University. Huntsville. Yeah. So is that like like a booth kind of thing, like like a space that you're renting out for that? I, I rent out just a wall right now. It's about seven feet wide, almost eight feet tall. Anytime I'm changing out all the art that I have themed out on the wall, I usually have to say to my husband, are you available? Because I'm not <laughs> supposed to climb up and down stools and it's a <laughs> Hi, I need somebody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but that's been going pretty good for the last year. Huge learning curve in regards to thinking about how to take art that's not in a series and how am I going to have it as a theme that's the current season. Yeah. And that's a lot of rabbit holing on Pinterest and internet searching mm-hmm. for art wall series and gallery walls for that particular season so I can kind of see what other companies are doing and say oh well I've got this this and this and if I pull that in now I have something but that can take me weeks sometimes letting it mull in my head while I'm running errands or something sure or it starts clicking so for the moment I make handmade cards as well because I'm trying to have a diverse price point yeah the cards are what's I, I sell most of at this point okay but oh, art great. can be slow it, it's a very personal thing for someone sure. when they buy art to come bring it into their home yeah I think you know I guess what I wanted to like ask you about with that is you know like when people are you know going through life they decide to start doing art and they want to sell it how did you go about like getting this wall space there because I'm sure they only have you know like like they have so much space that they can offer somebody to put their work up and then they have like limit like do you have like a limitation or, or rules or things that you can only do There's, or there is a whole contract every every place is different I I know low mill has its its own guidelines and rules for mm-hmm. their studio spaces 
any booth place like University Pickers. They all have contracts and guidelines and, and rules. And in regards to getting in, I think you have to be ready to sell. I mean, I'm, I was not running around to all these craft fairs and art fairs. It's just scheduling anything out months ahead doesn't work in my current mm -hmm. season of life. So I was looking for a place where I could at least have my art out and share with people it's available rather than trying to balance the, the craft fairs and the art markets mm -hmm. at this point. Once I made that decision, it was just going and seeing the different marketplaces around town and finding the one that fit us best. University yeah. Pickers was a, a top contender because it's like five minutes from my husband's work. And maybe at most 20 minutes from our house. So it was it was convenience. It's a wonderful building to be in. Some of the marketplaces I've been in, I was a little concerned about the condition of the buildings. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So you, you kind of want to look at that as well, where you're bringing your artwork in. Is sure. What's the upkeep and, you know, what's the condition of the building I'm putting my my art in? That is a great point because mm -hmm. I have totally walked into some places like that. The little markets that have like booths or, you know, like, you know, like vintage stuff or flea market mm -hmm. places. And they'll just have like a bucket on the floor where some there's drips coming from the ceiling. And you I'm will like, not have that at University Pickers. Yeah. They're, they're very much about keeping their refinished furniture, not just the art, but the refinished furniture. They they want to make sure things are... It's not a yard sale environment. It's a vintage yeah, environment. Yeah. And they keep the place up. I mean, they really do. Um, oh, that's wonderful. And uh, a wonderful experience to, to shop there. Yeah, yeah. That's great. I think it I think it's a good point to like bring up, you know, what what are you looking for when you're wanting to sell your art? Cuz like you mentioned, like doing the the like the festivals and the tents mm -hmm. and all that, for some people that's just not the way to go. It's too much. It's too complicated or you have to travel or it's exhausting and you can't physically you know manage it or whatever so then what where else can you go and so then you think about you know where could you show in town and maybe not even realizing you know maybe the local like antique shop or whatever mm -hmm. they have space or would be willing to have you come in and have space you know and what that would look like and thinking about your art being safe there and not like also too like have you had any issues with like stealing or anything like that not on my wall unfortunately where it is a retail place there yeah. have been problems and the owners of university pickers are doing you know everything that's in their power that they can do yeah. to try to discourage that and I know for me, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. You're fine. But I, I, I did a post. I, I've thought of doing a post sometimes, but I think it's, you know, might be going too far and kind of trying to remind people that they're, that if they pick pocket in a marketplace like this, they're stealing from their neighbors, you know, yeah, really. but instead of kind of coming straight out and saying that in any of my posts, I try to introduce university pickers as a small business shop. These are your neighbors that you're shopping from and just having posts along that lines. And I guess that's kind of what I would love people to just remember is yeah. you're shopping from your neighbors in these little marketplaces. These yeah, are people not, who are getting products like, ready for you to sell to you as yeah, yeah. their income. Yeah. And you know, like one of the kind, one of the kind things, and not like something that's mass produced, where you've got hundreds more, you could just replace it. You right. know, yeah. And they're <laughs> like always awesome. reminding us when they do their little social media posts and videos. University yeah. pickers is reminding people: if you see something you like, that might be the only one, and it might not be here tomorrow. Yeah, you might want to grab it. <laughs> yeah, really, so. really. 
That's a great point. And also a great reason to be like, go ahead and purchase it. If you like it, go ahead and get it. You know, well, that's really, that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about the complications with that, but at the same time, you're not having to like set up an art tent and travel around. It's right there near where your husband works. Mm -hmm. You've got him. He's there helping out. You know, I don't know if he he helps with display or whatever, because I do the same thing with my husband. I'm like, whenever I ha- I've, I have done festivals, but it is very hard. And I don't know how some artists do it constantly. Right. Um, and back to back. It's 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 a yeah. lot. I just did my first market with a tent second Saturday in June. So recently. And yeah. that was that was the first one that I didn't sell anything at either. I've gone to like craft markets that are indoor ones and mm-hmm. during the holidays where I'll do one or two of them at that point in time. Because they have the table, they have your inside, you don't have to worry about a tent. Yeah. Um, but the the effort that went into, you know, getting that tent up, you know, and setting up the tables and trying to have things right and think about the wind and all of, you know, any breeze that might come about. I can't imagine doing that week on week. And and these markets are always a, a roll of the dice about how much you're going to sell. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Weather, weather. That like too. This past weekend, I went to a festival, but there were like four or five other festivals going on at the same time. Mm-hmm. And so that's what happened with this last market is there was just so much happening around the the traffic wasn't high enough. Yeah. And in those seasons and you're trying to do, you know, man, oh, that's so frustrating. And I've had experiences like that, too, where I haven't like I've done the whole like hauled all of my stuff out there Mm -hmm. and then just hardly sell. And like, I think I've sold enough to to cover the cost of being there, but did it like make a profit in any kind of way? You know what I mean? Like it was not nearly enough to like make it feel worth all of the effort. (laughs) And I was just leaving kind of disappointed, like, man, you know, like I really put a lot into it. And now it kind of makes you question, you know, like if it's really worth doing that over and over and over again, you know, but then I have artist friends who are doing that and they are full time. They can live off of it and mm-hmm. do amazing. And I, but I think one of the things that were what I think about is, you know, they kind of build up an, an, like an audience or, or followers who, yes will know that they're there. They'll know that they're at those specific places or those specific times. And they they literally go to the market because they know that person's going to be there. Yep. It kind of feels like, like maybe you have to work up to doing a bunch of them where it doesn't work out. And then maybe and eventually people are like, oh, yeah. Elizabeth Cribb's going to be at this show. I really need to get over there because I saw her post a beautiful flower and I want it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's one aspect of it. I think the thinking about sales funnels, because that was yeah. something I did also looking at these vintage, vintage markets is, mm-hmm. well, how many people shop at these markets and is there a chance to make a sale with art? Because Art is a, a leisure item for most people to put up yeah, on their sure. walls. It's the last thing many people think about is mm-hmm. putting up an original piece of artwork. Sure. Buying a print at a local big box store is probably quicker, mm-hmm. maybe not quicker, but more affordable for them to mm-hmm. be doing. And what I've come across is just the sheer number of people who end up needing you know, when you go working through the sales funnel in order to make a sale, I, I think the other aspect behind it all is how big of a crowd does this one market draw? And yeah. out of that crowd, how many people have are there to buy? Yeah. You know, some people go just to look. Yeah. Which is, which is fine. 
I want my art to be enjoyed by everyone. And, but amongst those who are enjoying it, who's there to buy? Yeah, that's very true. Because I think about all the years that me and my mother probably went to markets and didn't buy anything, but we were, we went because it was something to do and it was Mm -hmm. interesting and we got to look around, but we couldn't really afford necessarily to, you know. But you enjoyed your day. Yeah, we had fun. Yeah, <laughs> but and, it was and that fun. to me is important too. That that's one of the gifts I want to give to others is just something to enjoy in that moment. Well, and uh, one thing that I have started doing as an adult when I go to things like that is I try to get a business card or like mm-hmm. you know postcard or whatever they have laying around, or even take a picture of their banner if I like what they're making. Yep. And then support them through like social media or, you know, like taking a picture and tagging and saying, hey, this artist is really amazing. It's at this market. You know, yeah. I mean, I do stuff like that all the time in a way that I try to like, you know, let people know that they're doing a good job, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe that's come from being a person who has taken their stuff to a market and yeah. realize how hard it is to like actually do that. Man, I just think anyway, any way anybody can like support artists. It's a, it's Absolutely. a, you know, a kindness, I guess. Well, what are, what have been some of the challenges that you've had as an artist? Staying focused. That that's, and I think when I say staying focused, I'm always finding other interests. And then there's the the time, you know, the mm-hmm. season of life I'm in right now. There's a time crunch and getting yeah. things done, you know, the, the lessons done, the practice done, mm-hmm. and and making the art pieces. And you know, I, I'm, and then it's kind of like I asked when my husband went to uh, Germany this past fall. I asked him if he could try to find just a handful of schminky, super granu- granulating watercolors for me. I was having a hard time finding them in the States and not paying a lot for shipping. He generously came home with more than a few. I had 40 <laughs> watercolors to swatch. <laughs> what? Oh, no. <laughs> it, it, it was awesome. wonderful to have that many, you know, colors and all those choices. But I was, you know, trying to swatch them all. I just like buckled down last week and said, I'm just going to finish this. I'm like, I'm not doing anything else. I'm going to finish that. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do right now is to look at what projects did I start. You know, I got into tea snippets because I like painting on tea bags once in a while. And I wanted to get back into and doing a little bit of embroidery. So I found an artist who does tea bag snippets. And now that's kind of like a side project once in a while that I do. Yeah, and I keep kicking around collage and I'm like, okay, focus on the landscape thing, learn that, and then maybe you can put that into a collage later on. Oh, Elizabeth, so it's like you staying are, focused because my brain is always going. You are, you are speaking my ideas. language right now. I have that <laughs> same problem. Oh, it's so hard to just like stay focused and really finish like even like working in a series, you know, mm-hmm. like finishing an idea or a concept and instead of going whichever way, you're yes. like, oh, I like this. Oh, I like this. How can I bring them together? Wait a minute. I have to look yeah. at that first before I can pull it all together. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it'd be wonderful to have it all just like, you know. Yep. Oh, that is so true. Oh, my goodness. Because with these uh, tea bag snippets, they use fabric. And I'm thinking, oh, my surface pattern design can go on fabric. And now I can kind of start pulling oh. it together. And I'm like, you know, years down the road, I'll finally have a practice with all these little tiny, you know, wow. side trails that I go down together is one thing, but that'll but be it, years. You know, it feels so, I think it just feels so exciting to like realize, you know, maybe in the, I'll eventually do this and then I'll do this and I'll, mm-hmm. and then I want to learn this and I'm going to pull this in here. And it's like, that's, that is part of the fun and the excitement of like working yes. through what you want to do. But then at the same time, it can keep you from actually 
getting something done, like having a finished having a something. finished series or a finished piece or yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do right now is to finish some of the the side tracks that mm. I you know side trails I've gone down. Finish those, put them aside, get focused on understanding landscapes because I'm realizing that if I understand the construct behind something then I can bring it into a mixed media piece and, and make it even and something more special, you know, mm-hmm. something more uniquely me. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I probably do the opposite in a way that I don't learn about something enough before I start doing it. And then I end up probably spending more time struggling through it before I realize, you know, I need to go and learn more about this. You're probably doing it the right way. I, I do it both ways. But there, there have been things where I'm like, I'm just going to dive in and try this. Oh, okay. I got to go back and learn that. I like guess not exactly how I thought it was going to go. Maybe I don't right. have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. Yeah. That Focusing, I, th- I think I know a, a lot of artists that have issues with focusing and their creative practice and everything and, and being able to, you know, finish something. And I think I feel like that's one of the reasons why, like, having a show or having an event or, like, saying, okay, at the end of the month, I want to have a show with all of my birth month flowers you know, and having that deadline and making it like, mm-hmm. ma- even if it's self-imposed, like you're like, this is what I want to do. I'm going to put this up here. And then I'm going to let everybody know that I have this series, you know. Well, that's how I did the birth month flower series. Yeah. Like I was going to finish one every month and with the newsletter and social media, it's like, okay, it's starting. I'm going to have something new by the end of the month. And I realized giving myself that kind of deadline is stressful and oh, not man. always a, a healthy stress for me uh-huh. because in the season of life I find myself in I need a flexible schedule I need yeah. to be able to uh-huh. extend the deadlines and I've had some things that I've extended the deadlines in what feels like infinity and I'm like <laughs> okay I need to think about <laughs> how many things I bring in and how many things I can fit yeah it can be a challenge to know what that is sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you don't want this in the interview or on the podcast, I'm just going to let you know that I signed up to be a part of your watercolor thing at Low Mill that you came up with, right? Like watercolor. The, the exhibit celebrating watercolors in July of 2025. And yeah, we'll see what ALWCA says as to what exhibits are going to be yeah. happening in 2025. I'm I'm hopeful. I think that's an excellent idea. And I, I know that there's, you know, a lot of watercolor artists in the area, you know, and that would kind of even bring people together that, mm-hmm. you know, enjoy doing the same kind of thing. It's kind of fun. Yeah. And watercolors are a diverse medium. I find them very magical in that way. Um, yeah. So when I go up to find other watercolors, what I'm discovering is there's so many ways to use that medium. The mm-hmm. fashion world has used it. Illustrators use it. Architects mm-hmm. have used it. And then there's artists who all have a different process in bringing art to life with watercolor. And, sure. Um, Knowing and having seen some of that for almost the last decade really inspired the the thought process. Can we bring different watercolor artists together to kind of celebrate this medium and how diverse it can be? Yeah, absolutely. You are so right about that. It's like when I, you know, like I've done watercolors for a while, but I've gotten to where I don't do them as much. And I felt like, you know, this would be a wonderful opportunity to kind of push me to do some more of that and get back mm-hmm. into 
doing traditional watercolor because I really enjoy it. It's really, I mean, it's challenging enough and you have to, in my, in my experience, experiment with it in order to get things to go the way that you want it to go <laughs> mm-hmm. and just kind of, you know, and, and it can be very slow, but also very fast. And it's so fun. It's a really fun thing to do. And so I thought, man, I really love that idea and I want to get involved with that. And I thought that that would really push knowing that there was something out there that I could, you know, have something in that I could push myself to, you know, work on some things or make some things or whatever. So I just wanted to bring that up because I was excited about it. (laughs) And then, you know, what, what kind of advice do you have for other people, either, you know, people starting out or people who want to get into doing watercolor work or interested in, you know, like displaying their work in a shop or anything like that? Do you have some advice for people that you recommend? Well, if you're just starting out with watercolor, don't expect yourself to suddenly be ready to to start selling it in the the first year. There's a lot to learn about watercolor. Mm. Uh, I feel like there's chemistry to it because of how the colors mix with each other or push on each other. Mm. And then there's that water to paint ratio that just seems to take forever. To, I still have moments where you know better, and why are you using so much water? Listen, out of you know, that's one of those. That's a thing that has. That's so. Like I was doing watercolor all the time, mm-hmm. and I felt like I had figured that part out, and then stopped for a while, and now I don't know how to do it anymore. <laughs> I'm like, no, yeah. I knew how to do this before. I'm like, what am I missing? Juicy. There's yeah. <laughs> there's cream, there's <laughs> coffee and tea, coffee yes. uh, a little more than the tea, and then between the the cream and the coffee and tea is that juicy milky one that is what you use almost all the time. And then there's trying to see you know if, is my paper still the correct wetness because you know watch out for those blooms. You might have to work with some blooms if you don't have to have your balance right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I've over the years too, I've collected all different kinds of papers. Which mm-hmm. paper do I use for this? Which paper do I want to use for that? It's like a press, it, cold it, press, it, and rough. Yeah. And then there's all the brands. Yeah, no, I know. It's, 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 but it's, I think that's what makes it so fun and interesting you know, to experiment with because there's so many. And then, you know, you can get you can get your salt and you can get your, you know. Alcohol, salt, charcoal, graphite. There's just so many. Then there's water-soluble pencils and ink tents, the neo-pastels that are water-soluble pastels. Yeah. I've even played with oil pastels and wax paraffin for resist yeah so there's a lot you can do with watercolor and i think if you focus on watercolor for a year and just getting to know it you'll find your style and your way with mm. it and then maybe in the second year you know you might start producing some works that will be ready to go unless you know sure. of course you've already done art before and you've got the art skills from a previous medium down yeah you know, maybe somewhere in the first year you might be ready to go with, with your watercolor yeah, but yeah i think if you're brand new to art and you're starting out with watercolors you've got to give yourself grace for a, at least a year yeah, of, yeah. of learning it playing around with it and trying to find someone to mentor you through it if you feel like you need Sure. That person to tag team it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And even like you did, you you went and took some class, like a class. Mm-hmm. That's huge. I feel like that, you know, learning from other artists and doing that kind of thing where you can. Sorry, I've got 
spam call in the middle of the- of course uh, like i don't know who you are what do you want but i guess what i'll say is you know like picking up you know a class or a course can really kind of push you to know more about it because it's it's such a it's such a a medium i feel like i don't know it really does build on experience in such a way that like you really need to sit down with somebody who knows it, like really yeah. knows it. And that yeah. can, that can do make miracles happen, you know, cause it's hard to do it on your own and, and to have any idea what you're doing, honestly. I mean, it's, yeah, it's I've had a handful of tough. teachers throughout the years and I think growing your art, can come from being willing to go to workshops and, and finding opportunities to to sit with an artist who are is so many steps beyond what you're currently doing and learning from them. So it pushes you out of your current comfort zone. Yeah. But that that kind of comes after the, the learning curve. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's great advice. So where can we, we've already talked about it a little bit, but just to reiterate that, where can we find your art, you know, follow you, get in touch with you if we're interested in buying something? Okay. Everything is under Lizbeth Pareto. Lizbeth is Elizabeth without any vowels. So L-Z-B-T-H Pareto. You can start on my website, ElizabethParadoff.com, and you'll You'll see a few products on the website. Society6 offers more, and there's a link out right to that. Locally, University Pickers, 3405 Triana Boulevard in Huntsville. And social media, I am on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And that is also under Elizabeth Pareto. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today, Elizabeth. It's been so fun to, and thank to you learn. for having me. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. And I, I just love what you're creating out there. I am in love with your website. I think you've thank got you. a really good setup there. And I'm excited to see what you do with your your new what 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 is this like your new direction that you're kind of picking up there and trying to Thank you for listening to Art Talk with April. New episodes are out every Tuesday at 6 p.m.